coming together to save a watershed. How adversaries in Colorado overcame their differences to protect a place they all love. Far from casinos and glitzy shows, stunning desert mountains in Nevada hold the promise of new and sustainable tourism. The water we receive from nature leaves our property in that same crystal clear state. From the mountains to the bay, California farmers and ranchers find new ways to conserve precious Sierra water. And talk about a blast from the past. These icy archives are revealing vital clues to our changing climate. We can tell what the temperatures were. We can tell how dusty Australia was. Bundle up and buckle up for This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Turner Foundation. Hello, and welcome to This American Land. I'm Caroline Ravel. And I'm Bruce Burkhart with some great stories about people dedicated to the conservation of America's natural resources, its landscapes, waters, and wildlife. Today, we start with another story about how the Natural Resources Conservation Service supports farmers and ranchers in the important work they do protecting their working lands. We sent our crew to Northern California to see how private landowners are using more efficient methods to save precious water flowing from the Sierra Nevada mountains down to the coast. Almost all of the water that Californians need starts as snowfall in the Sierras. It melts and makes its way down through various land uses, be it forest land, range land, crop land, and eventually into the Bay Delta. NRCS works hand in hand with agricultural operators to make sure that this water is available to those that need it throughout California. Be it a farmer in Fresno, a resident down in Los Angeles, or a, a vineyard up here in the Sierras. Come on, Candy, let's go home. I'm Ann Johnson. I'm a fourth generation wine grape grower here on our farm in El Dorado County, California. My great great grandfather began in the early 1900s. He started with some cows and some sheep and goats. And since then, my grandfather and now my father have gotten involved. When the grapes were originally put in in the 1970s, overhead sprinklers were the standard means of irrigating grapes. In fact, as a kid, I moved portable irrigation pipe through the vineyard. So these are our overhead sprinklers that we're continuing to use for frost protection, but this is how we irrigate the grapevines now. Through our partnership with NRCS and their EQIP cost sharing program, we've been able to convert the vineyard from overhead sprinklers to drip irrigation with a water savings of 20%. Water is a very important issue for any rancher, and that's especially true for a wine grape grower. We have to check and make sure that the pipes are large enough to handle the extra water that's going to be required for that block. You know, NRCS came out um, several years ago and helped us create a conservation plan for our ranch. It was great because they listened to what our ideas were and issues that we wanted to focus on and then gave us tools for our toolbox so that we could put in to practice some of those ideas, the drip irrigation being the primary one. If more farmers could switch to um, efficient irrigation systems like these, we'd save a lot of water in California. We know that the water can better get to the roots and also they're not using more water than is needed. And so the crops are healthier and it, it makes more water available for downhill users. This water tank has been here my whole life. I assume my uh, grandfather put it together. Water for a place like this is everything. Water grows the grass and without grass, you can't raise cattle. So you have to make sure that you manage your land and your water. 
I'm George Forney. I'm 60 years old, and I've lived on this ranch all my life. And I'm Tony Forney. I'm married to this guy, and we're ranchers in El Dorado County, California. One of the things we do here is rotational grazing. Rotational grazing essentially means that you're moving animals from one area to another area. There's something for you. It allows you to uh, manage your, your ground better so that you're not overgrazing in one particular spot. And when you move them to that other area, everybody requires water. You just can't move them to a dry pasture. You've got to move them to a water source. Here's the trough. So that means we've put in stock tanks so where they're uh, drinking water above ground rather than standing in their own water. And then they come into a nice area with good grass and they, they continue to eat there for, say, approximately 30 days. You'll be able to manage each of the specific grasses that are in those fields more closely. What NRCS has done for us is allowed us to make sure that every one of our pastures has a good water source. Straight out to the southern fence line going that way. And they also offered financial assistance. I'll get it all documented in your plan. We had to put up money too, but they came in and offered to help us with creating a better fencing plan and they helped us put in a well. We couldn't have done it without their help basically. And it wasn't a handout as much as it was a leg up. The applicants from the EQIP program are chosen for environmental benefits to the taxpayer. In other words, the lowest cost for the maximum amount of environmental benefit. Where I'm standing now was all brush 10, 15 foot tall when Jeremy came to our office for assistance. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a rancher. I'm born and raised in New York City. My wife was born and raised in Oakland. You know, our idea of a tree is a lemon tree in the backyard, right? So this is new to us. My name is Jeremy Wagner, and I'm a forest landowner in El Dorado County, California. You can see tiny little pine trees. Look at how tiny that one is. Since 2004, we've planted 18,000 trees on the property. That would not happen purely out of my pocket. Without NRCS, I might have been able to do a section of it, but I would not have been able to do 200 and whatever acres. This brush has all been treated with a masticator where it is ground up to make a good planting medium. 25 years from now, it's gonna look like that for 250 plus acres. And uh, that's exciting. Uh, it's exciting to hike through. It's exciting to look out. It's exciting to know that you're putting green on the planet, uh, which needs green, <laughs> you know? And the river is, is the draw. It's not just necessarily the amount of water that's important, it's also the quality of water because water is a source of life for crops and wildlife downstream. Wetlands are a natural filtration system for water. So as water travels through the, these fields and heads out to the Pacific Ocean, it's being cleansed through the vegetation that's present on site. The wetlands here historically provided habitats for large numbers of shorebirds, waterfowl, and songbird species. So the vast majority of the wetlands here in California have been lost um, or transformed due to agriculture or urbanization. The Wetland Reserve Program's mission is to restore wetlands for general wildlife species. The Wetland Reserve Program is basically a conservation easement program. We are retiring the agricultural uh, uses of the site. We pay a portion of the fee title value of the property and we help the land restore it back to historic wetland conditions. So it's really a win-win for the public, the private landowner, and the bird. This is where it all starts. NRCS strives to make sure that this water is clean when it makes it downstream. It's also abundant. And we make it a priority that the water we receive from nature leaves our property in that same crystal clear state. My mission is to, the water is clean now, is to keep it clean. There's duck's nests all over this place. There's birds by the jillions around here and I just, keep the wildlife in mind, whatever I do. The wildlife was here long before we were, and I just try to maintain it both ways. 
When people start conservation campaigns, they often run into opposition from others whose ownership or use of natural resources might be affected by conservation measures. Determined opposition can stall or even defeat important conservation work if both sides refuse to compromise. But the community in Colorado has shown that collaboration among a wide variety of stakeholders can succeed in producing a widely supported bill to protect a critical watershed. Everything we can see here is the Hermosa, spectacular part of Colorado. We have over 100,000 acres that has not been disturbed, and it's one of the largest parts of Colorado that has not yet been protected. I'm Ed Zink, and I'm a third-generation rancher in La Plata County in Colorado. Come on. Today I'm wearing a cowboy hat, but I've been in the Hermosa with a motorcycle helmet on, with a bicycle helmet. I hike, I fish. I hunt, so I've been in the Hermosa with just about every kind of headgear and shoes you can imagine. I've been blessed to have the opportunity to ride my horse in every one of these canyons in the Hermosa. It's been quite an experience. The Hermosa Creek watershed is one of the few remaining intact watersheds of this size, probably both in Colorado and throughout the continental United States. The wealth that it offers in just the natural landscape is amazing. I mean, just arriving here today, we saw two or three different species of raptors. It's just a real wealth of, of natural beauty and, and abundance. My name is Jimbo buick -Rood, and I'm the Public Lands Coordinator for San Juan Citizens Alliance. We're real lucky that the Hermosa is intact and close to the place it was quite a few centuries ago. There's a road that goes through the north side, but otherwise uh, there's just trails in the territory and it's very intact. We see a lot of territory that, you know, this is nipped away for that, this is nipped away, and so you get a smaller and smaller area. But to actually take the whole watershed and look at that as an entity is really the important piece. So we're trying to get, get ahead of the game here before there's some really significant threats to the Hermosa. This was basically a wide variety of stakeholders that came together to determine how best to manage the Hermosa Creek watershed. How could we protect the values of the area while at the same time allowing the uses that were there now to continue? And it was, it was those discussions and negotiations that eventually led to the basis of the legislation that's in Congress right now. There's unanimous support among the county boards in San Juan and La Plata County. I'm Pete McKay, a county commissioner from San Juan County, Colorado. To protect these wild lands will sustain our economy both currently and in the future. Tourism in general is really important for Southwest Colorado, and that involves historic tourism, riding our train, and also visiting the backcountry. You can leave the town of Durango downtown and be hiking in, in the south part of the Hermosa in 15 minutes. From Silverton, you can drive south, also be hiking within 15 or 20 minutes. So this is the playground for these towns. It hasn't caught what I call the Aspen disease. If, you, if you've been around Colorado, you know what I mean. It's still just Durango, and we like it that way. Exactly. Businesses come forward and say, hey, protect this place. It's important to the local economy from, from many standpoints. The safest spot in the, in the building is... Uh... So this is our 80,000 square foot headquarters building. We're building this here because we love Durango. One of the reasons we love Durango and are so committed is the Hermosa Creek watershed. Our employees love to live here. They love to work here. They use the Hermosa Creek watershed to fish and to camp. They bring their families and their kids. And it represents why businesses commit to this area. Hey guys, how you doing? My name is Jeff Wyden. I am with the Wilderness Society in Durango, Colorado. I think the lesson from this is that people can work together. What we did is we took the Hermosa and worked out a compromise for what types of uses should be allowed in what areas. So for example, in this area, you can ride a mountain bike. In the wintertime, you can, you can drive a snowmobile. You can always hike and, and horseback in here, but you can't use other motorized vehicles in the summer. 
In other parts of the Hermosa, you can ride dirt bikes in the summer and ATVs and Jeeps and things like that. What made the Hermosa effort and ultimately legislation so successful is that all the various groups came together, all supporting the protection of the Hermosa Creek watershed and the continuation of those uses. And you have this incredible community consensus. Everyone got something out of it and everyone gave something to get to it. We didn't look at this block of land or that block of land. We looked at every piece of ground that drains into Hermosa, and we didn't look at anything that doesn't drain into the Hermosa. Protecting the watershed has three different uh, attributes. One is to protect the clean water for drinking sources in Durango, Colorado. It also gives water to our grazing and agricultural interests and we have our cutthroat trout fishery, which is so important. I love to fly fish and catch trout anywhere, but uh, it will be even more special to be able to really fish for, for cutthroats in here. There's just something really exciting about being able to fish for the native species that were, that were in here from a long time ago. Well, I think the cooperative effort has been successful here on the local level. And now if we get success in Washington, D.C. with our congressional support, this could be used as a template for not just Colorado, but other special areas throughout the nation. And I'm absolutely convinced that, that approaching it collaboratively is the best way to do it, and it's the most efficient way. The Hermosa is a very special place, but all wildernesses and roadless areas are special. This one's just special because it's close to us. It's been on my bucket list to get the Hermosa protected, and hopefully we'll get it done before I pass away. Now we'll take you to Nevada, in that vast expanse of dry desert and mountains between Las Vegas and Reno known mainly for its colorful gold and silver mining history more than anything else. Much of the land is managed by the Federal Bureau of Land Management, but there are some Nevadans that believe there's good reason to give more protection to special areas in the region. And we went there to find out why. Most people, when they think of Nevada, they think of Reno, Las Vegas, hotel casinos, glitz gaming, lights, and everything in between is just wasteland but it's not. If they'd taken the time to actually get into Nevada, to walk up into the mountains, to even walk out and explore that desert and to look under their feet, they would discover an incredible world, a natural world that has been traditionally overlooked. My name is Kirk Peterson. I'm the inventory coordinator for the Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Right here, of course, we're in the Volcanic Hills unit. And then what we see is that Immigrant Peak area, that beautiful, beautiful multicolored volcanic hills. And then in the distance is Lone Mountain. Yeah. So what we've got is wilderness, 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 totally accessible by all these really well-developed roads around it. Friends of Nevada Wilderness was established in 1984 to promote the idea of the wild and natural side of Nevada, the other side of Nevada that, that most people don't take the time to look or explore. Since the mission of Friends of Nevada Wilderness involves wilderness advocacy, that mission includes working very closely with the BLM to provide information about lands with wilderness characteristics and to make sure lands with wilderness characteristics are being protected. How did they make this? My name is Julian Pellegrini. I'm a science teacher and a fifth generation Nevadan. Friends of Nevada Wilderness hired me to look at recording species lists in proposed wilderness areas. We're looking at central Nevada to designate certain wilderness areas because they have rich desert biodiversity and encompass very fragile desert ecosystems. The areas that we're in here are the volcanic hills, the immigrant peak area, and silver peak area. A lot of insects. As for my own personal part, I spend the days hiking around, identifying bird species, insect species. I walk around at night with a black light looking for scorpions. Bighorn would look for a spot like this. Their only real defense is to go up, and they know what's on the top of the hill. It's just right above us. But from here, it'd be hard for any predator to get near them, and they have an excellent lookout that covers the whole valley down below them. So it's a pretty secure spot. 
a lot of my interests in the outdoors and in biology and in education came from growing up with a father who was deeply interested in these things and in these areas and taking me out on the weekends hiking in these hills and the hills around Mason Valley. I think these areas exhibit a very rich quality of Nevada that is in a lot of places all but lost. I can go on a hike for three days or four days into an area that's designated wilderness and know that I'm not going to hear the motor of a vehicle or four-wheelers or that sort of thing. What I'm walking down is evidence of old mining exploration operation. In fact, here's the claim post right here. What we have is bulldozers came down or a bulldozer came down and took the top surface off just to see what was underneath, to see if there was some mineral potential that was economically feasible. This happened before we had mining reclamation laws for the federal lands, so no one ever reclaimed it. But as you can see, it's actually starting to reclaim itself. There's about 30 years of growth, and most of this is native vegetation. Because of this idea that there's always something to be found out there, many people will resist the idea of setting aside some of the land that's left that still has natural integrity. The economy has always been based on mining, and it's an economy that cycles from boom to bust. We have to find something that's sustainable. There's another wealth in Nevada, and it is the wealth of the natural integrity, the wealth of open spaces, the wealth of wilderness, the wealth of solitude. And this is a wealth that you can actually access, utilize, and make a living from. Morning, Donna. Good afternoon, John. How's it? My name is John McCormick. I'm the general manager of the Mizpah Hotel in Tonopah, Nevada. People coming up and down the, uh, the highway here would find this a great stop-off point for them, certainly coming to the Mizpah with all of its grandeur and glory. Between uh, Las Vegas and Reno, we sit right in the middle, and there's just some tremendous things for people to see along the way. This is um, very typical of the way most people experience Nevada is from these roads. I tell you, if you go two miles that direction, that won't get you even halfway to the base of those mountains. And by that time, all of this stuff goes, and you're in a land that is completely dominated by natural processes. Growing up, people always would talk about a place in Nevada where a person could feel that they were the first person there in the last maybe 150 years, and that's what wilderness offers. The light never is the same, the ground is never the same. It always is under a constant state of change. I have never not been surprised at the diversity of plants, at the beauty, at the incredible landscapes, at the geology of each and every one of these areas we walk into. And we are only looking at a small fraction of what's in the state. There's so much more out there that needs to be looked at and explored and understood and documented. Those are the reasons that I'm out here, is to maybe leave some legacy for future generations, to try to designate wilderness and do my part for preservation of Great Basin wild places. They need to be preserved so that my kids and their kids would be able to come into these areas and be able to see the same things that my father showed me. And our goal is to get those identified, protected, and promoted for the values that they have. may be the closest thing scientists have to a time machine. They provide remarkably accurate information about the environment of tens of thousands of years ago. And as Miles O'Brien explains in our Science Nation report, they can also help researchers look into the future of the changing climate of our planet. It's a busy, freezing cold day inside the National Ice Core Lab in Denver, Colorado. Now we're gonna cut gas samples out of this core. Scientists from Maine to California here to cut pieces of precious Antarctic glacier ice to take back to their labs for study. We started the Ice Core project in 2005. With support from the National Science Foundation for a project called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, or Waste Divide, lab manager Mark Twickler and a team of scientists, engineers, and support personnel traveled to the bottom of the world to drill out and bring back these ice cores. The goal of the project, to collect and study perfectly preserved records of the distant past. The unique things about polar glaciers is each year that it snows there, the snow never melts. So you get one year of snow on top of the next year of snow. It compresses, so everything that fell out of the atmosphere, dust, salt from the ocean, volcanic ash, is preserved in that ice core. 
This particular ice sheet is more than 70,000 years old. The team drilled down more than two miles into it to retrieve these cores, which were then flown to the U.S. and stored in a giant 40 below zero freezer here at the ice core lab. Uh, inside this freezer contains more than 10 miles of ice cores collected from around the world. Twickler says the ice cores layers are like tree rings, each layer representing a year of weather and snow. We can tell what the, what the temperatures were. We can tell how rough the oceans were around Antarctica. We can tell how dusty Australia was. Scientists are keen to study the bubbles trapped in the cores, each a tiny pocket of air frozen in time. We can measure a variety of gases that were in the atmosphere at the time the bubbles were formed. Other scientists want to know how ice sheets melt over time. We don't necessarily have a really good handle on how the ice sheet as a whole will respond in a case of changing climate. Twickler says this icy blast from the past is helping researchers better understand the mechanics of climate change and that in turn will help them make better predictions as to what a changing climate may mean for our future. Thanks for joining us on This American Land. And remember, you can catch us anytime on thisamericanland.org. We'd like to hear your comments and your ideas for stories you think we should cover. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Turner Foundation.